Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and good morning to everyone. So how are you today? I wish you happy new year 2021 and I hope uh, our our personal life and our study uh, life uh, goes well and I hope everyone happy with new year celebration. Okay. So today is our final class, our last class for Malaysian economy and uh, the topic is about foreign sector so now uh, it's better for me to explain to you what is the learning outcome of this uh, chapter okay at the first place uh, in this chapter we should able to understand uh, the contribution of the uh, foreign sector and its importance uh, towards the Malaysian economic contribution. And then we have to look at the overview of the uh, Malaysia exchange rate and also the Malaysia tracks of balance. Okay, so now we go further uh, about the definition what is the foreign sector so uh, basically uh, this um, foreign sector is the aggregate macroeconomic sector that uh, contains uh, everyone and everything beyond the political boundaries of the of the domestic economy including the household business and the government uh, of the other country all right so uh, the foreign sector refer to the open economy that comprises everyone and everything outside the political boundaries in the domestic country and it is one of uh, for macroeconomic sector in the circular flow. Uh, for example, the household, business, government sector and also the this foreign sector. And uh, the primary sector uh, function of foreign sector is to undertake the uh, external activities that is outside the uh, control the, of the domestic economy. And this term also used in many ways, okay, include the following export and import, uh, the portion of the economies that is owned by foreigners and uh, the account of the country or for those involving uh, in this international transaction. Okay, so now we take a look at this contribution and the importance of the foreign sector. Okay, actually uh, there are a lot of contribution of this foreign sector towards uh, our economic uh, development because it can uh, spur the continuous uh, development by creating employment and modernizing the economy and then it can also provide the global linkage between the countries, the foreign market access and the worldwide investment opportunities and also enhance the international cooperation between the countries and then uh, the third contribution is uh, also to provide a wider variety of the choices for the consumer for ourselves okay and then to increase the competition and the lowest price uh, that we can gain from this competition and the last one is also to uh, enable the technologies transfer Okay, now uh, I can explain to you uh, more about some of the contribution towards this uh, foreign sector. Okay, so uh, as we look at the second point there, this uh, foreign sector can provide the global linkage and uh, it's also known as the interconnectivity of the world economy that has been accelerating at the rapid pace over the last uh, 50 years. And Malaysia has been building multilateral relationship and um, uh, forgo uh, foregoing the international cooperation with other countries through this uh, foreign sector. And it has gained access to the foreign market via the widening of the market for locally produced goods. And the investor can also choose to invest uh, their capital either in our domestic companies or elsewhere. And the second, uh, the third part of this uh, contribution is uh, the variety of choices for our uh, our choice, our, we as a consumer. Because uh, I can give you this example. Most of us love a spicy product. For example, mi samyang, okay, samyang noodles come from Korea. And we have our own product, which is mi sedap. So for those who want to eat uh, spicy, spicy noodle they will choose this import product samyang mi even though the price of this product is quite higher compared to the misadap but they can get the satisfaction there 
Okay, that is one of the example that we uh, as human being uh, always uh, ch choose in our daily life. The second one is we can look at the automobile where we have a variety choice. There is not only Proton and Produa, but we also have Euro product or US product, for example, Mercedes, uh, Japanese Toyota and Honda, and also the... Um, uh, Volkswagen and BMW so we can choose and suit our interest with our uh, income for example and the last one what we, we I can share here is the technology transfer where this foreign sector enable direct transfer of technology through the involvement and investment of the foreign companies in our country in terms of their expertise and capital because we know that this technolo technology transfer will uh, enhance the technological progress and improve the local workers through knowledge and also skills okay so now we look at the uh, next uh, impact which is positive impacts of the globalization on the economy all right so this is the positive impact of the globalization on the economy. So we have five uh, positive impact, okay, for this uh, for the sector in our economic uh, contribution. Okay, so the first one is the faster and the cheaper exchange of the goods, money, and ideas. Then we also can see the positive impacts in the uh, the benefit of that particular free trade itself, and then sharing of the labor and expertise and then the number four is sharing and transfer of technology and the last one is the economic growth via the foreign investment so now i will explain further about this positive impact okay so uh, we have five of them and I, I would like to explain about the second uh, positive impact which is benefit of the free trade Okay, uh, as we know, free trade, we know it's uh, liberalization due to the economic globalization occur when there are no artificial barriers placed by the government to restrict the flow of the goods and services between trading nations, uh, causing uh, the increase of the production. The countries that uh, have a comparative advantage will specialize in the production of the those commodities. So from this, the consumer also enjoy a greater variety of the goods and services. And then uh, the last one is the economic growth via foreign investment where the foreign investment accelerated the process of the economic development in Malaysia. And then uh, since independence, okay, in 1957, as the country has been uh, one of the most globalized uh, developing countries. So uh, this globalization is claimed to the uh, major factor for the Malaysia economic growth and uh, the development. So I can say that uh, this positive impact can contribute uh, towards uh, the economic development as a whole. Okay, so next we will learn about the negative impact of the globalization on the economy. So class, as much as we already know how positive are the impacts of globalization towards Malaysian economy, however, globalization could also cause negative impacts yeah, towards the Malaysian economics. First, it would create unemployment which is caused by local industries that is being unable to compete. And then secondly, it will create instability in domestic markets. Uh, other than that, globalization could also uh, create environmental damage which is caused by lax environmental protection. And then uh, globalization also could lead to labor exploitation, social degeneration and problems, as well as black markets, illicit cross-border activities and multinational crime syndicates which I will further uh, discuss uh, later on. Yeah? So uh, let me briefly explain to you some of these points. The first one, um, how neg uh, globalization could create unemployment. Yeah? Although free trade has its benefits, there are some drawbacks. Trade barrier removals and foreign dumping of surplus products at lower cost cause intense competition, leading to shutdown of local industries and short-term structural unemployment. 
infant industries as well as local small and medium industries SMIs with no short-term protection policies but the government may find it difficult to develop economies of scale and become established in a competitive environment. Structural and unemployment affects many workers, their families and local economies. Workers who are laid off will face difficulties in getting jobs, which require their skills specifically and this is worsened by geographical or occupational uh, immobility of the workers. As major industries tend to be heavily concentrated in certain regions, structural unemployment often leads to regional unemployment and impacts can be quite serious. Regional unemployment occurs when a, an industry concentrated in a particular area has to close down. If we look at the second point, globalization will uh, cause instability in domestic markets. What does this mean? Yeah? So class, globalization increased domestic economic instability due to international trade cycles. When our economies depend heavily on uh, global markets, businesses, employees, and consumers become more vulnerable to downturns in economies of our trading partners. For instance, the recession in the United States of America had reduced Malaysian exports, leading to falling export incomes and lower GDP. Moreover, countries depending largely on agricultural sectors would face unfavorable terms of threat as their import incomes are much lower than the import payments. And if you look at the third uh, negative impacts is the environmental damage. How does this could happen? Yeah? Under weak environmental legislation, in some developing or underdeveloped countries, globalization can lead to pollution and preventing environment pollution into their price of goods so as to reduce their cost of production and increase their competitiveness. With the industrial revolution, natural resources will soon be depleted or extinct. This will cause an unbalanced environment, leading to climate change and other major catastrophes such as flash floods or haze. And then if we look uh if we take a look at the other points would be uh globalization would also cause black markets, illicit cross border activities and multinational crime syndicates. With globalization, ICT revolution, the sharp decline in transportation costs, the growth of mass tourism and the slow development of multilateral arrangements for detection. Illicit cross border activities have become rife or easier. Multinational crime syndicates engaging in human trafficking or smuggling of people for the sex and drugs threats have flourished. Global financial liberalization has also facilitated tax evasion and money laundering. So in the next one, we will take a look at what are the strategies to meet globalization challenges. So class, apart from the benefits uh, and cost of globalization to the country, Malaysia has fully adapted to the changing needs of globalization in order to optimize its advantages and prevent its adverse effects. In facing the challenges, Malaysia has implemented multi-faceted strategies since the 8th Malaysian Plan 2001-2005 to for continuous and greater economic growth geared towards a developed country status as discussed uh, such as sound macroeconomic management to maintain macroeconomic stability. During the 8th Malaysian plan period, the government pursued sound macroeconomic management. Several policies were implemented in order to ensure Malaysia's macroeconomic stability such as ensuring low interest rates and inflation, and inflation uh, policy administering prudent fiscal and monetary policies, attracting quality domestic and foreign investment, enhancing the development of the growth sectors, and maintaining a healthy balance of payments positions. So what balance of payment position, we will take a look at it uh, while we are pursuing into uh, the chapter later. Yeah? And then secondly is the banking reforms to maintain financial stability, Third, one of, uh, third of the strategies 
to maintain globalization would be development of small and medium-sized entities, as well as development of science and technology. Science and technology is one of the key weapons to face the challenges of globalization. Uh, some of the steps that were taken to develop uh, science and technology are students were encouraged to pursue uh, science and technology during their secondary and tertiary education. And then secondly, technical and vocational training was provided in order to skilled and semi um workers. And then the MSc was formed with the aim of advancing Malaysia in terms of information and technological infrastructure towards improved productivity, quality and efficiency. Next, we will take a look at the development of research and development as one of the strategies in order to meet globalization challenges. The government has encouraged local firms to undertake R&D and technological innovation activities through the provision of fiscal and financial incentives. Joint research programs between industry and public sector institutions um, as well as activities in commercializing R&D findings were promoted throughout the years. So Malaysia has accomplished a satisfactory level of competence in conducting agricultural R&D, for example, in rubber and palm oil. However, R&D in the industrial sector is still at low level. So Malaysia has also taken the initiative to upgrade R&D facilities in universities, training centers, and as science and technology parks. In addition, fiscal incentives were extended to the private sector to encourage their participation in education, uh, training, and R&D. So the other uh, strategies to meet global, uh, you, know, you know, to meet the globalization challenges are also enhance um, quality of life, strengthen moral and ethical values. Just now, we already talked about the strategies to meet globalization challenges. Now, let's take a look at the more important part of this uh, chapter, that is the overview of balance of payment. So, I thought those who already learn macroeconomics, I think they already uh, heard about these terms, yeah? balance of payment. So, what is actually balance of payment? Balance of payment is a statement showing the net exchange of the nation currency for foreign currency, from all transactions between the nation and foreign nations in a given year. So here, balance of payment also refers to a statement of systematic records of all economic transactions between one country and the rest of the world in a given period of time. The balance of payment shows the details of the total payments made by one country to other nations and the total receipts received by it. So the balance of payment, or BOP, also refers to the difference between the total value of goods and services imported and exported over a given period of time. All economic um, transactions are merchandise trade or services such as transportation, insurance, banking and others. The balance of payment or BOP includes both visible and invisible goods. The BOP accounts records both debits and credits. So what is debit? What is credit? A debit is any transaction that supplies the country's currency in the foreign exchange market. A credit is any transaction that creates demand for the country's currency in the foreign exchange market. A debit is indicated by a minus sign because it signifies the outflow of money, whereas a credit is indicated by a plus sign to signify the inflow of money. To have a deeper understanding of the balance of payment, let us take a look into the BOP structure in Malaysia. So, what are the major components here? Major components of BOP includes current account balance, capital account balance, and official financing account or official finance reserve. Yeah, or official reserve account if we call it here. So, what is a uh, capital account? Yeah, the second section of BOP is the capital account. Yeah, if we look here, current, you know, it's the current account now. Yeah, it's the the which contain receipts and payments of goods and services. But what is capital account? So in Malaysia, BOP example of capital accounts is capital transfers and non-produce and non-financial assets. 
For example, financial accounts include the purchase of shares or bonds, extending loans, buying government securities, or purchasing property, direct investment, portfolio, and other investments. Okay, so for capital account, there are two types of transaction in the capital account, which namely private and official. What are official reserve account or official financing account? The official reserve account consists of government gold and foreign currency reserves as well as government reserves with the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the Special Drawing Rights, SDR. IMF is an international organization created to oversee the international monetary system. So the IMF holds currency reserves for member countries and make loans to central banks. SDR is an international money mechanism created by the IMF in the form of bookkeeping entries that can be used by countries to settle their international account. So in the next slide, we will talk. Uh, we will take a look uh, about benefit of surplus in balance of payment. Class, let's take a look at the benefit of surplus in balance of payment. First, balance of payment provides the foreign exchange for the country to invest overseas and earn additional foreign exchange from the investment. Secondly, the surplus in balance of payment could reduce reliance on foreign investment. Because here, we have a surplus balance of payment, so we do not have to rely on foreign investment all the time. Yeah? We have our own surplus in balance of payment. And then the third one is to improve the resilience of the country. Fourth is to provide the foreign exchange for country to import the requisite technology, equipment and expertise to generate faster economic growth. Last but not least, surplus in balance of payment could improve the international standing and image of the country. What are the adverse effects of deficit in balance of payment? What will happen if balance of payment is experiencing deficit? First, depletion of the country's foreign exchange reserve. Second, may require the government to borrow to finance the deficit and increase the size of international debt. Third, it may affect the credit rating of the country if national debt becomes too large. You know credit rating, right? Credit rating is just like us, like we... You put yourself, yeah. For instance, uh, when you are doing some loans, yeah. If you are not paying on time, so you uh, it will affect your credit rating or credit score. The one that you always heard, like secrets, uh, this is some sort of like what we have ever heard before. Lah. So this credit rating of the country will be affected eh, if the national debt becomes too large. And then burden to service the national debts. This will adversely affect the country's development program and rate of economic growth. Another effect of deficit in BOP, economic and political sovereignty of the country may be compromised. So what are the factors causing deficit in balance of payment? So what are the factors? First, deficit in service account from uh, shipping and insurance. Second is the repatriation of profits for FDI. FDI is foreign direct investment. yeah, And then the remittances um, of wages for foreign labor, leakages from imported semi-processed goods or low value added from manufacturing, and then fluctuating price of export and foreign exchange risk. In the next slide, we will learn about the issues and problems of balance of payment. What are the issues and problems of balance of payment? First would be the increasing import intensity. Second is the merchandise trade deficit. The third one is the current account deficit. And then we have the saving investment gap and external uh, debt. Yeah? So what are the measures to overcome the problems? First. Export promotion. 
The main purpose of export promotion policy is to increase the value of exports of the country in order to reduce the deficit in the balance of payments. The export care value can be increased through strengthening competitiveness. The key factors in strengthening the export competitiveness are developing quality products with lower prices and improving marketing strategies. The government can encourage exports by giving subsidies or granting tax holidays or abolishing exports duties for local exporters. At the same time, the government can promote local products in international markets and provide information to local exporters on how market, how to market their products globally. Further, the government can enter into bilateral or multilateral trade agreements with other trading partners in, other, in order to avoid huge differences in its balance of payment. Secondly would be the discouraging import. The government can restrict imports of consumer products and substitute them with locally manufactured products. This can be achieved by imposing high tariff rates or quotas for imported products. When such measures are levied on imported goods, their import prices will increase and the quantity demanded will decrease. Through campaigns, the government can increase the sense of loyalty among loyal customers to buy locally manufactured products. For example, Belilah Barangan Bata Malaysia campaign is to encourage Malaysians to buy locally made products. Restricting the supply of foreign currencies will also discourage the local consumption. Then we can use uh, the other measure uh, to overcome the problems in BOP uh, would be strengthen service sector, increase investment into country. Okay, besides like we invest on other country, why not we increase the investment into our own country? Other uh, measures uh, that is not stated in the slide would be using the government's reserves. The government's reserves in the form of gold and foreign currencies are used to balance the deficits in the balance of payments. However, this measure can be used for a short period only because continuous payments from government reserves will will only serve to deplete them in the long run. And then we have this devaluation. Devaluation is the government's policy of lowering the par value of the country's currency compared to the currencies of other countries by an official edict or announcement. By reducing the par value of the currency, it will automatically reduce the value of the home currency and increases the value of foreign currencies. This will stimulate exports because foreigners can now purchase more goods and services than before for the same amount of money. The imports from foreign countries will decrease because foreign goods will become more expensive. The importer has to spend more money now in order to buy the same amount of goods than before. Thus, it will help to increase the value of exports and decrease the value of imports. However, this method will only be used uh, as last resort. This is because the success of the method depends on a few factors such as the elasticities of imports and exports, demand, absence of inflation in the country, and an absence of the retaliation by other countries in order to devalue their currencies. In the last section of this uh, chapter would be the exchange rate. Exchange rate can be defined as the price of one currency in terms of another currency. In other words, we know of the domestic price of the foreign currency. Buyers of imported goods or investors who want to invest in other countries should convert their domestic currency into the currency of the nation that they are going to deal with. For example, an importer in Malaysia who wants to buy digital cameras from Japan will need to convert the Malaysian ringgit to Japanese yen to carry out business with Japanese firms. Importers and investors should know how much foreign goods, services, and investment will cost them in terms of their own currency. So, now I think uh, we have come to the last section of uh, chapter 7. So, to sum up, uh, this is going to be your last chapter. And all the best for your upcoming exam. And see you again in revision week, yeah?